Uh, welcome back to Bentonville 156, a Carolina's campaign virtual event. I'm Derek Brown, the operations manager here at Bentonville, and I'm joined tonight by the godfather, so to speak, of Carolina's campaign historiography, Dr. Mark Bradley. Uh, Dr. Bradley is a historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. He received his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Bradley has written numerous books on the Civil War and Reconstruction, including Last Stand in the Carolinas, the Battle of Bentonville. Uh, he's currently writing the official Army history of logistical support in the Vietnam War and is co-authoring North Carolina and Military History. Dr. Bradley has been a longtime supporter of Bentonville Battlefield State Historic Site and is an academic advisor to the Friends of Bentonville Battlefield. He personally has always been kind and gracious to me, always patiently answering my numerous questions about the battle. Tonight, Dr. Bradley is going to set up the battle and take us through day one. Check back tomorrow night for days two and three plus the battle's aftermath. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. All right. As Derek just said, we're going to start with day one of the battle, but before we get to the battle, I'd like to talk about the events leading up to the Battle of Bentonville. And I think the best place to start will be with Major General William T. Sherman, the commander of the forces, the Union forces that will be at Bentonville. Um, We'll go back to December the 21st, 1864. Sherman has just completed his march from Atlanta to the sea by presenting the city of Savannah, Georgia to President Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift. Uh, Sherman will now be looking northward for his next move. His destination will be uh, Richmond and Petersburg, where he will link up with the forces under, under the command of the Union Army's General in Chief. Uh, Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant. Sherman's march will take him through the Carolinas. He will make a stop at Goldsboro, North Carolina, and there he will link up with the forces under the command of Major General John M. Schofield. That's the Union Department of North Carolina forces. Schofield was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and his troops have since been transferred to eastern North Carolina. Schofield will have two corps under his command, under Major General uh, Jacob D. Cox and Alfred H. Terry. Sherman's forces will be divided up into two wings. Um, you'll notice that the blue stripes are the Union columns and the red stripes are the Confederate columns. The commander of Sherman's left wing or Army of Georgia is Major General Henry W. Slocum. You'll see a lot of Slocum because it's his forces that will be fighting in the first day's battle at Bentonville. Then the right wing commander of the Army of the Tennessee, uh, led by Major General Oliver O. Howard, and then the 3rd Cavalry Division, commanded by Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick. Now these forces will total about 60,000 officers and men. And they will be facing a much smaller Confederate force initially under the command of this man, General PGT Beauregard, the commander of the Military Division of the West. The Confederacy is getting smaller and smaller, and the uh, Division of the West is now hugging the Atlantic coast. The troops under Beauregard's command are uh, number roughly 33,000 but they're scattered all over the Southeast. And in the words of the Confederate Cavalry Commander, Wade Hampton, it would scarcely have been possible to disperse the force more effectually. Sherman will begin his, command, uh, begin his campaign by entering South Carolina on February the 1st, 1865. He will be passing through, um, uh, the 15th Corps will be passing through McPhersonville, South Carolina. And uh, you can see the uh, uh, buildings in the background on fire. This is going to be a characteristic of Sherman's march through South Carolina, the Union soldiers uh, taking a special care to punish the state of South Carolina for being the cradle of secession, as they put it. By February the 17th, Sherman has reached the capital of South Carolina, Columbia, and it's become plain to the Confederacy's newly appointed general in chief, Robert E. Lee, that Beauregard is not up to the task of stopping Sherman's advance. So on the 22nd, 
Lee appoints General Joseph E. Johnston to command the forces in Sherman's front to concentrate all available forces and drive back Sherman. Now, Johnston is anything but uh, optimistic about his prospects. In fact, he's convinced at this point that he's been put in command by President Jefferson Davis to uh, compel him to endure the humiliation of surrendering at the end of the war. But I think Johnston will find out very soon that he's mistaken. Johnston has four different forces under his command. Uh, first, Hardy's Corps, led by Lieutenant General William J. Hardy. He'd been a subordinate under Johnston during the Atlanta campaign in 1864. And by the way, Johnston had been removed from command the previous July at the instance of President Davis. Davis had ceased to believe that Johnston would be able to save the city of Atlanta. Hardy commands 13,000 Confederates on February the 17th when his forces abandon Charleston and begin to head northward to avoid being cut off by Sherman's columns. By the time that Hardy reaches Aversboro, North Carolina, one month later on the 15th of March, his forces have been whittled down to just 6,500. Nearly all those troops, the result of uh, desertions and uh, illness, and Governor Andrew, South Carolina Governor Andrew McGrath's militia recalls. Secondly, the Army of Tennessee contingent will be led at Bentonville by Lieutenant General Alexander P. Stewart. They will number around 4,500 at Bentonville. This is just a shadow of the Army of Tennessee that had faced Sherman during the Atlanta campaign in 1864 which had numbered as many as 70,000 troops. And the Department of North Carolina forces under the command of General Braxton Bragg. When it becomes apparent that Sherman will be entering North Carolina, Johnston requests that he be given Bragg's Department of North Carolina troops. And Bragg is uh, actually the uh, begs President Davis to relieve him of the embarrassment of having to serve under Johnston, because it is Bragg who, as Davis's chief of staff in July of 1864, had recommended that Johnston be removed from command. So there's a lot of history there between these two men. And then finally, uh, Johnston's ablest subordinate, commander of his cavalry, Lieutenant General Wade Hampton, who has arrived in South Carolina, his home state, just in time, uh, bringing along um, General Matthew C. Butler's uh, cavalry division with him. He arrives just in time to find that the Federals are on the verge of occupying his hometown, Columbia, South Carolina. And the following morning, February 18th, his ancestral home, Millwood, will be lying in ashes. Needless to say, Hampton will be thirsty for revenge against Sherman and the Blue Hordes. And he will find an opportunity to meet out that re revenge at Monroe's Crossroads on the site of President, uh, present day Fort Bragg. It's there that Hampton will lay a trap for Kilpatrick. In his Eagerness to try to prevent the Confederate cavalry from reaching Fayetteville, North Carolina, Kilpatrick will divide his cavalry into three parts in order to stop Hampton's advance. And what he does is he gives Hampton a golden opportunity to overwhelm his forces at Monroe's Crossroads on the morning of March 10, 1865. It's there that Kilpatrick has made his headquarters. And as you can see from the map, the Confederates at dawn will launch an attack from three different directions and they will succeed in overrunning Kilpatrick's camp and driving most of the uh, federal cavalry into the swamp to the south of the camp. Kilpatrick will lead a counterattack and succeed in recapturing his, his encampment, his headquarters but not before Hampton has succeeded in freeing all the Confederate prisoners and in dealing a, a startling blow to the Federal horsemen. 
at Monroe's Crossroads. And it's there that Sherman will learn that the Confederates are far from beaten. They still have plenty of fight left in them. Now on March the 11th, Sherman will capture Fayetteville, North Carolina, and with it, the former U.S. arsenal. And he will direct the first Michigan engineers and mechanics to destroy the arsenal on March the 12th. Now, while, <clears throat> while the federal troops are resting and relaxing uh, in Fayetteville, Sherman will plot the final part of his march, which runs around 450 miles from Savannah to Goldsboro. Sherman will send the right wing under Howard on a direct road to Goldsboro with the, the, uh, all the unnecessary wagons from the left wing under the command of General Slocum. The left wing will advance in light marching order on the Raleigh Stage Road heading in the direction of the state capital. This means, by this means, Sherman will keep the Confederates guessing as to what his objective is. Will it be the state capital in Raleigh or Goldsboro, the railroad junction leading to two coastal cities, Wilmington and New Bern? And on March the 15th, Sherman will begin his advance, meeting him at uh, a point about five miles south of Aversboro, North Carolina, will be General Hardy's Corps. Hardy's mission is to buy time for Johnston to concentrate his army so that he can attack Sherman at a point of his choice. And it's on the afternoon of March the 15th, the Federals will run into Hardy's troops. And in the process, Kilpatrick's chief of scouts, Captain Theo Northrup, will scoop up one of Hardy's brigade commanders, Colonel Alfred Rett. Under the command of Colonel William O. Butler, Rett's brigade will hold the first Confederate line, and then Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Elliott's brigade will hold the second line, and then the third line will be held by Major General Lafayette McClaw's veteran division. And this may look familiar to those of you who uh, are interested in Revolutionary War history. Um, this is a similar formation to what Daniel Morgan had used at Cowpens in January of 1781. And then just a few months later, uh, Nathaniel Green will use roughly the same sort of formation at Guilford Courthouse. And the intent of Hardy is to uh, set up a defense in depth. The less experienced troops under uh, Rhett and Elliott are uh, accustomed to fighting uh, on the coast of South Carolina and get, have done very little marching in open field combat. So it's up to McLaws division to hold the, the third and main line. But Rhett's brigade is well disciplined. Even though Rhett is cordially hated by his men, in fact, one of the Confederate prisoners claimed that if Red had been captured, his own men probably would have shot him. He is a stern disciplinarian, and Red's troops really show their uh, mettle uh, during the uh, first several hours of fighting. In fact, uh, Sherman is forced to launch a flanking attack on Red's right flank. And that will be Colonel Henry Case's brigade launching that attack. And they will succeed in surprising uh, Rhett's troops because they'll burst out of the woods yelling as they run towards them and they succeed in driving them off. And in the words of one federal soldier, the uh, Johnnies showed their heels as fast as God would let them as they fall back to the second line under Elliot. And with very little pressure, the Federals succeed in driving back that line. And then finally, they move up to the third and main line, which has now been bolstered by two divisions of cavalry under the command of Major General uh, Joseph Wheeler. And McClaw's troops succeed in holding that third line. And John uh, Sherman decides that he's going to launch a general assault on that main line on the morning of the 17th. And then unbeknownst to Sherman on the evening of the 16th, will begin to retreat towards Smithfield. 
where the main Confederate force is gathering. The Federals have taken about 682 casualties at Aversboro, and that's one reason why Sherman wanted to avoid a general assault if possible, because each additional man who's wounded will have to be carried along with the uh, rest of the column. And keep in mind that Slocum's forces are marching in light marching order. That means they have very few ambulances. Now, while Hardy is fighting Sherman at Aversboro, Joe Johnston falls back to Smithfield. When he assumed command, he was at Lincolnton, North Carolina, then successively fell back to Charlotte and Fayetteville before stopping at Smithfield, which he makes, uh, he establishes his headquarters there. And that's because Smithfield is roughly midway between Raleigh to the north and Goldsboro to the south. And depending on which direction that Sherman decides to move, he will attempt to block Sherman's advance. Now, on March the 17th, it becomes clear to Hardy that Sherman is heading towards Goldsboro. His columns are all moving almost due east in that direction. Johnston has decided that he is going to uh, try to give battle to Sherman. And he is concentrating his forces there at Smithfield. He learns from his political ally, Senator Lewis T. Wigfall of Texas, in a letter that arrives while he's at Smithfield, that contrary to what he believed, it was not Davis, but it was Lee who urged to have Johnston restored to command. And when Johnston receives this news, he sends a letter, dashes it off to uh, Wigfall, saying that Knight of old never served his king more faithfully than I will serve General Lee. So Johnston decides on March the 17th that he's going to fight Sherman if possible. But where will the battle take place? He sends a rider dashing off to the south to find General Hampton, who has been falling back with the rear guard, trying to slow Sherman's advance towards Goldsboro. The rider finds uh, Hampton at the Willis Cole Plantation, a few miles south of Bentonville. And that's where Hampton makes his headquarters. Johnston asks Hampton, if he has found a place to launch a surprise attack on Sherman's columns. And Hampton said he has found the ideal location near Bentonville and urges Johnston to send his troops marching to the south to that point. The Johnston troops move out from Smithfield on the morning of March 18th uh, at the remnant of the Army of Tennessee and Hoke's division. And General Hardy's troops are now moving south uh, towards Bentonville rather than Smithfield. And, and finally, Hampton's cavalry will be trying to slow Sherman's progress, both the left wing under Slocum and the right wing under Howard. And you can see by the uh, blue arrows that they're all heading in the direction of Goldsboro. Sherman's two wings will reach the vicinity of Bentonville on the, uh, late on the afternoon of March the 18th. And at this point, the two columns are closer together than they've been at any point on the march since they left Fayetteville. Just a few miles separate the two wings. And up to this point, Sherman has believed that Johnston will try to stop him from getting Goldsboro, as, as he puts it. But then two pieces of intelligence lead him to believe otherwise. The first is that his cavalry commander, Kilpatrick, has informed him that prisoners say that Johnston is falling back on Raleigh and that he's opened the road to Goldsboro. Secondly, Sherman's map of North Carolina is worse than useless in the words of his chief engineer, Colonel Orlando M. Poe. It omits the one road that Johnston is using to move his troops south from Smithfield to Bentonville, and that is the Smithfield-Bentonville Road. And when the Confederates burn the bridge across the Smithfield Clinton Road, Sherman relaxes because he believes that Johnston is now falling back on Raleigh, as Kilpatrick has said. 
So the Confederates will have a real opportunity at Bentonville on the 19th to launch a surprise attack on the Federals. But there's one thing that's working against Johnston. That by the night of the 19th, Hardy's Corps is farther away from Bentonville than Sherman's advance. So in the words of Johnston, he will not have the opportunity to strike the head of a deep column and pull up the Confederate or federal line as he had hoped. Now, when Johnston arrives at Bentonville on the evening of the 18th, it's dark, so he's unable to reconnoiter the battlefield. He will have to rely on his cavalry commander, Hampton, to lay out a plan of attack. And Hampton has come up with an excellent one. Classic hammer and anvil maneuver. Hoke's division will block the main uh, Goldsboro Road and prevent the Federals from advancing. And while Hoke is holding up the Federal advance, the troops of the Army of Tennessee and Hardy's Corps will form on Hoke's right, and they will be the uh, hammer. They will sweep down and roll up the federal line and launch an attack that will crush Slocum's wing at Bentonville. That's the plan of attack, but time is working against Johnston. Will he be able to get enough of his troops up to Bentonville in order to uh, 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 land it? A crippling blow. Now on the morning of the 19th, Sherman has decided that he's going to join Howard's wing. He wants to open communications with General Schofield, who's moving towards Goldsboro. But before he leaves, he has a brief conference with his subordinates uh, on the Goldsboro Road. And one of his subordinates, the commander of the 14th Corps, uh, Major General Jeff Davis, my favorite Union general name, tells Sherman that he expects that they'll run into more than the usual cavalry opposition. To which Sherman replies, no, Jeff, there's nothing out there but Jeffrey's cavalry, which is a small 800-man cavalry division under the command of Colonel George G. Dibble. Said, brush him out of the way. I'll see you tomorrow morning at Cox's Bridge. And Cox's Bridge being the rendezvous point between Slocum's and Howard's wings en route to Goldsboro. But unbeknownst to Sherman, they will not reach Cox's Bridge on the 20th. In fact, they will not reach that point until the 23rd because the Battle of Bentonville will intervene. Now, the uh, lead division in Davis's 14th Corps is commanded by Brigadier General William P. Carlin, and they will move out around 7 a.m. on the morning of the 19th. And as they advance, they can hear uh, firing in the distance. Uh, Union foragers, or bummers as they're nicknamed, are out trying to scrounge up uh, rations for the troops, and they're running into trouble. They keep running into uh, Confederate cavalry, and in the words of one of the bummers, rebels don't drive worth a damn, which is a phrase they hadn't heard since the Atlanta campaign in 1864. Now, Carlin is dressed in his best uniform. He uh, later said that he did so because he expected that they would have a major battle against the Confederates on that day. But by wearing his best dress uniform, Carlin will be standing out like a sore thumb. Keep in mind that these federal soldiers have been on the march for over 400 miles. Most of them are dressed in rags by this time. The reason that Carlin dresses up is that he wants to show the second division whose dust he's been eating for the past few days. The second division under the command of, of James D. Morgan, how a real West Point professional uh, advances on the march. And he has his men uh, uh, unfurl their flags, has the brass bands playing. You would think that uh, battle was the farthest thing on his mind. Well, as he advances, he runs into uh, a detachment of foragers under the command of Major James T. Holmes, and Holmes is unable to drive off the uh, Confederate cavalry in his front. Well, Carlin turns to Holmes uh, once his troops are up, and he says, get your bummers out of my way, and I'll drive the rebels out with a skirmish line. Well, Carlin has three brigades. The first one is uh, under the command of Harrison Hobart. He's leading the way. His skirmishers succeed in driving off Dibble's cavalry. And then they reach that main line uh, 
along the Goldsboro Road, blocking their advance. And all hell breaks loose as the North Carolina Junior Reserves open fire on them. And Hobart's men begin to scatter. And soon, the second brigade under the command of George P. Buell moves up. He also deploys to the north of the road. And then the third brigade under the command of David Miles deploys to the south of the Goldsboro Road, off to the right. And everywhere they uh, are moving forward, everywhere they advance, they find Confederate uh, soldiers. This is far more than the uh, uh, 800 uh, Dibbles cavalry than they had expected. Now, General Slocum is getting un impatient. He is expecting very little interference on the way to Goldsboro at this point. So he decides that he's going to launch an attack on the Confederates and his front. Now keep in mind that Hoke's division, roughly 6,000 strong at Bentonville, will be in his front, off to his left, unbeknownst to him, the Army of Tennessee contingent is deploying. Now when we think of the Army of Tennessee, uh, this is, as I said, just a shadow of the force that faced Sherman the year before in the Atlanta campaign. Just to give you an example, Major General D.H. Hill commands the largest corps in the Army of Tennessee at Bentonville. They number around 2,700 troops. That would have been a small division just the year before. There are also Stewart's Corps and Cheatham's Corps reduced to just 900 troops each. That's about the size of an early war regiment, but that's all that the Army of Tennessee can bring to Bentonville on March the 19th. By the way, I should point out there's bad blood between Hill and Bragg. Hill has served under Bragg in the Battle of Wises Forks from March 8th to 10th, a battle that was fought in Kinston, North Carolina, leading up to the Battle of Bentonville. Bragg had succeeded in driving back a part of the Union line at Wise's Forks, but then on the 9th and the 10th, the Federal's superiority in numbers has started to tell, and they end up forcing Bragg to fall back. But it's there at Wise's Forks that Hill and Bragg have a bit of a reunion. Now keep in mind, that Hill had served under Bragg in the Battle of Chickamauga, and afterwards uh, Hill had said that Bragg had cost them uh, the fruits of the victory there at Chickamauga, and he was summarily dismissed from the Army of Tennessee. And in a, 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 a dispatch to Hill pleading with him to uh, march to the right to the front to join Bragg at, at Wise's Forks, Johnston has begged him to forget the past for this emergency. Then, on the eve of the Battle of Bentonville, Hill has written out a, a dispatch to a reply to Johnston. Bragg has made me a scapegoat once, and he will do it again. I can't feel other than unpleasantly situated. Well, fortunately for Hill, he's now serving under General Stewart in the Army of Tennessee contingent, but no doubt looks across the field and realizes that Bragg is there commanding Hope's division and dreading what the result could be. So now, Slocum will launch a probing attack to find out what's in his front. Miles Brigade off to the right to south of the Goldsboro Road will be running into Hoke's entire division. Up to the left, Buell's Brigade and uh, Bryant's wing of Hobart's Brigade will launch an attack against the Army of Tennessee troops to the north of the Goldsboro Road. And the attack will take place at around noon. The plan is that uh, they will uh, outflank the Confederates and then drive them away and resume the advance. But what they find is far different from what they expect. Now, the smallest brigade in Slocum's wing is Buell's little three regiment brigade, which is off to the left, up to the north, Three regiments, the 13th Michigan, 21st Michigan, 69th Ohio, about 650 men in all. Not so very different from the whittled down forces they're facing in the Confederate Army of the South, as Johnston has called his newly minted force. 
And this is how the attack appears to Major L.P. Thomas of the 42nd Georgian Stovall's Brigade. The uh, right of the uh, Federals are going across, or actually in Thomas's front. And this is what Thomas says. He calls out, attention, 42nd Georgia has shouted to my men. Hold your fire for my orders. And when you fire, give the rebel yell. Bravely onward, the enemy marched in grand style. Nearer and nearer they came. When the Yankees approached to within 40 yards of my line, I at last gave the order so anxiously awaiting. A sheet of fire blazed out from the hidden battle line of the 42nd Georgia. We poured volley after volley into them, and great gaps were made in their line as brave Federals fell everywhere. Their colors would rise and fall just a few feet from us, and many gallant boy in blue is buried in those pines who held old glory up for a brief moment. Now that's what it looks like to the Confederates on the Army of Tennessee line. And this is how it appears to the attacking Federals. In particular, Company C of Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Bates uh, command, the 21st Michigan of Buell's Brigade. And Bates writes, the regimental color bearer, Sergeant Frank Foster, was Company C's first casualty. Although shot the wrist, Foster bravely clung to the flag, keeping it aloft, beckoning us on to victory or death. Corporal Mock was the first man in the company to fall, shot through the abdomen, a mortal wound from which he died the night following. We passed Corporal Kilmer a moment later, lying on his back dying, his feet squarely to the front. His smoking musket grasped firmly in his hands. A few paces farther along lay a young Confederate soldier about the same age and build, also dying. It has always seemed to me that these two fired and fell together. Louis Messinger, one of my oldest and best men, was the next to fall dead. My brother, shot through the thigh, made his way to my side to tell me he was shot. I could only tell him to make his way to the hospital as best he could alone. Well, the federal attack on the Confederates failed. They fell back in disarray and began to regroup. Now, in the meantime, General Slocum has decided that he wants to move up additional troops. And while the second division of James D. Morgan's, uh, Fort, well, James D. Morgan's 14th Corps Division is going into position on the Union right, south of the Goldsboro Road. Bragg is appealing for reinforcements. Miles' little 830-man brigade causes Bragg to panic, and General Johnston sends him McLaws Division, 4,000 troops in all, essentially taking uh, a quarter of his infantry and sending it to the south where it will just sit there for the better part of the afternoon. Now, someone has asked the question, uh, what would have happened if General Johnston decided to leave McLaws with the body, main body of troops north of the road and to form on the right of the Army of Tennessee? Well, there's no question that it would have made for a, mar a far more uh, a powerful attacking force. But I doubt that Johnston had enough troops at Bentonville, even with McLaws, fully committed to have defeated Slocum. However, there's no doubt in my mind that if McClaws had been on the right instead of the left of the Confederate line, the Battle of Bentonville on March 19th would have been far bloodier. So just as McClaws troops go into position, the Federal attack uh, ends. They fall back in disarray. Now, General Slocum has decided he's going to send the 20th Corps up to the front and, and put them on the line. But he receives startling intelligence from a, a Union POW who's made his escape during the, uh, the federal withdrawal after their attack. And it just so happens that this man is a native of Syracuse, New York just like General Slocum, and they actually know a few of the same people in Syracuse. Well, it so happens that that POW says that Joe Johnston was riding along the Confederate line, being cheered by his troops, telling them that they would fall upon the left wing at Bentonville, crush it, 
and then do the same thing to the right wing, to the South. And as if he needed more convincing, a Union staff officer who's been at the front supervising the deployment of Morgan's division rides back, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Litchfield says to Slocum, well, General, I find more than Dibral's cavalry. I find Confederate infantry entrenched along our entire line and enough of them to give us all the amusement we shall want for the rest of the day. Well, a light bulb finally goes off inside Slocum's head and he realizes he's in for the fight of his life at Bentonville. He immediately shifts to the defensive. Instead of sending the 20th Corps troops up to the front, he decides to deploy them to the rear on the Reddick Morris farm. Keep in mind that at Bentonville on March the 19th, the battle takes place essentially on three uh, plots of land. The John Harper farm to the uh, 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 west, the Reddick Morris farm in the center, and then to the east, the Willis Coal Plantation, which is the largest uh, such um, plantation in that part of the country. And now at 1.30 p.m., Slocum sends off a messenger. He's already sent one to reassure uh, Sherman that the, the firing that he might hear off to the north is nothing but a little bit of skirmishing. But now he's sending a very different message that Johnston has managed to gather his entire army in his front. So it's no longer just 800 pesky cavalry. He's now saying that Johnson has around 40,000 infantry at Bentonville, uh, roughly double his entire force. But at least he's now getting a far better, a far more accurate picture of the situation at Bentonville. And it's going to be up to Slocum's wing to hold out at Bentonville. Now, this has been a frustrating day so far for General Johnston because he's wanted to launch this attack since mid morning because of the, uh, the federal probing attack and the deployment of his forces, which is taking longer than he had expected. In his words, he said the deployment has consumed a weary time. He will not be able to launch his attack until mid-afternoon. That's when he finally gets uh, William B. Tolliver's division of Hardy's Corps on the extreme right of the federal line. And at 2.45 on March the 19th, he strikes the last grand charge of the Army of Tennessee. And this is how it appears to Colonel Charles Broadfoot of the 1st Junior Reserves. His line is at a right angle to uh, the Army of Tennessee as it moves out. And he recalls that it looked like a picture and our distance was truly beautiful. Several officers led the charge on horseback across an open field in full view, with colors flying in line of battle in such perfect order as to be able to distinguish the several field officers in proper place. It was gallantly done, but it was painful to see how close their battle flags were together, regiments being scarcely larger than companies and divisions not much larger than a regiment should be. Well, the Federals are able to put up a fight, but they're simply outnumbered. Rare time in the uh, uh, campaigns of 1865 that the Confederates actually have a numerical advantage, but they do at Bentonville, however, briefly. And the Federals begin to fall back. And this is what it, how it appears to one of them, Private Joseph Hoffines of the 33rd Ohio. He said, as we fell back, we came in full view of our enemies. Here was our greatest peril. Here they poured in one continuous fire of destruction. One man was shot down right by my side. On the other side of me, another poor fellow was shot in the back of the head. I did not know, but every moment would be my last and put an end to all my fond hopes of ever seeing home and friends again in this world. And in the words, uh, inimitable words of Lieutenant Charles S. Brown, we show to the Rebs as well as our own side some of the best running ever did. And as if that didn't get the point across, he also said, we show, we run like the deuce. So now the Federals are falling back. And as one of the staff officers of the 14th Corps rides up to the front, 
He watches the Confederates as they advance across Willis Cole's open fields. And he saw mass of his, masses of his own men slowly and doggedly falling back along the Goldsboro Road and through the fields and open woods on the left of the road. Many balls were whizzing in every direction. Although I was then far from the front line as I had left it only a short time before, the roar of musketry and artillery was now continuous. Checking my horse, I saw the rebel regiments in front in full view, stretching through the fields to the left as far as the eye could reach, advancing rapidly and firing as they came. The onward sweep of the rebel lines was like the waves of the ocean, resistless. So now the Federals south of the road fall back towards the swamps to the right of General Morgan's division. And in the meantime, the troops to the north began to fall back towards the Brennick Morris farm and don't stop until they reach John Harper's farm over a mile away. Now it's up to Morgan's division to hold the line. Now the Confederates are able to attack along the uh, left flank, but so far Hoke's division has not moved out. They were supposed to attack at the same time as the Army of Tennessee at 245, but it's not until four o'clock that Bragg finally orders Hoke's troops to launch the assault. And by that time, General McLaw's division is now pulling out of the line and going back to the rear. So they will not participate in that attack. That will give Morgan's men a precious extra hour of time to dig entrenchments and prepare, prepare for the Confederate onslaught. Now, is as the uh, Confederates begin to advance, it becomes clear to the 14th Corps commander, Jeff C. Davis, that they're actually going to uh, succeed in outflanking his position and getting in behind his main line. So Davis tells the commander of his 3rd Brigade, which is holding that point, Brigadier General Benjamin D. Fearing, he said, Advance upon their flank, Fearing. Deploy as you go. Give them the best you got and we'll whip them yet. All the Federals take up that shout. They said, hurrah for old Jeff. We'll whip them yet. But as that column moves out towards the Goldsboro Road to take on the Confederates, a sergeant, an old veteran, hears Davis tell his staff, those men are marching straight into hell. And that's in fact what they find. They're heavily outnumbered. It's up to them to launch a spoiling attack to buy some time so that Morgan's division, the other two brigades, can hold out. And as you can see from this map, Gearing is able to move out along the Goldsboro Road, take on the Confederates before he's driven back to Reddick Morris Farm, about a half mile to the rear but he succeeds in buying invaluable time for Morgan's division. And he also causes the Confederates moving into the rear uh, to uh, uh, move in in disorder. It will take them time to sort out their lines and for the officers to uh, impose order on their men. And while that is going on, Hoke's men will launch at least two attacks along the front and left flank of Mitchell's and Vandiver's brigade of Morgan's division. Colquitt's Georgian brigade will actually succeed in briefly punching a hole through the line before they're driven back. And then in Haygood's brigade, the red infantry, as they're called because of their artillerymen's uniform having red trim, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Douglas Taylor, will succeed in actually uh, reaching the federal line and punching a hole through it. Now, when they go into the fight, Taylor's force numbers around 267 effectives. Within five minutes, Taylor's command will be whittled down to less than half that number. They'll lose 57% of their numbers in that short span, killed, wounded, and captured. 
Taylor himself will be wounded and he will be taken to the rear. And that force that had started with 267 will be down to 152. Kirkland's brigade is also sent back, but they're getting ready to launch another attack again when the Federals decide they're running low on ammunition. The commander of the 14th Michigan, Lieutenant Colonel George W. Grumman, decides to launch a counterattack. They succeed in driving the Confederates of Hope's division back. One of the men, Corporal George Clute of the 14th Michigan, succeeds in capturing the colors of the 40th North Carolina. Well, as the Federals head back to their line, all celebrating their repulse of Hope's division, they see that fire is coming from the rear. The Confederates behind them from the Army of Tennessee have succeeded in uh, redressing their lines and they're getting ready to launch an attack. So the Federals are now taking fire from the rear and they're having to fight from the front of their entrenchments. So as they're exchanging fire with the Confederates, Generals uh, Mitchell and Vandiver decide to launch an attack on the Army of Tennessee troops in the back. And just as they begin to move out, Brigadier General William Cogswell's brigade of the 20th Corps moves up. Slocum has directed Cogswell to move in and support Morgan's division. And they attack the Confederates from the rear. And the Federals combined force succeed in driving the Confederates back across the Goldsboro Road. So Morgan's division is succeeding in holding its position. One of the Confederates who had gotten in behind Morgan's position, Private Hiram Williams of the 40th Alabama, relates what his Union capture told him after Morgan's stand. He said, they gave us credit for fighting them as hard as they were ever fought. And some told me it was the first time their line was ever broken. Some thought we had whiskey to incite us on. Quite a compliment. This is how the fight appeared to Lieutenant R.J. Heath of the 34th Illinois, who was among those troops fighting south of the Goldsboro Road. Heath wrote, I was there at Bentonville with a regiment that had faced Beauregard at Shiloh and Bragg at Stones River that had participated in nearly every battle of the Army of the Cumberland. We had taken a hand in the terrible assaults at Kennesaw Mountain and Jonesboro, but for the desperate valor of the rebels, and for a desperate resistance and a determination to whip them on the part of our own men, we found nothing in four years of Army life to compare with that 19th of March at Bentonville. So now the flight is moving west towards the Reddick Morris farm, and it's there that Slocum and Johnston will fight out the outcome of the battle. And two old antagonists from the Eastern Theater, Brigadier General William B. Tolliver, who had commanded a division in Stonewall Jackson's Corps, will be facing off against a familiar adversary, Private Major General Alpheus S. Williams, commander of the 20th Corps, who had led a division facing Tolliver in Eastern Theater. Well, now they're going to be fighting it out at the Reddick Morris Farm in Bentonville. This is how the Union position appears on the afternoon of March 19th. Several Union artillery, artillery batteries going into position. Now, this is how it looks to 20th Corps troops who are going into position watching the route of Carlin's division right before their eyes. Samuel Toombs of the 13th New Jersey described the route of Carlin's division as, said the vast field was soon covered with men, horses, artillery, caissons, etc., which brought vividly to our minds a similar scene at the Battle of Chancellorsville from the Eastern Theater, 1863. And then a soldier nearby from the 3rd Wisconsin said he saw men throwing away guns, knapsacks, and everything, and all running like a flock of sheep. Meanwhile, a wild-eyed officer dashed through uh, Battery C, 1st Ohio's position, yelling out, 
Lee's whole army is after us. Run for your life, boys, run. But there's no run in the 20th Corps troops on the Reddick Morris farm. They're moving in. They know they're going to be in for a heavy fight there. The first battery to arrive is Battery C, 1st Ohio, closely followed by infantry of uh, the 143rd New York, and they will hit the ground just to their front. And it's around that time that the Confederates will launch their first attack. It will be led by Elliott's Brigade of Tolliver's Division. And in the words of Corporal A.P. Ford, who was in on that first assault, the South Carolinian in Elliott's Brigade, he said that my eyes were in a moment filled up with sand, dashed up by the shrapnel, which struck all around. That's the artillery fire. I wiped them with my hand and keeping them closed as much as I could, kept on at a run. But as the uh, men of Elliott's Brigade advanced, Little did they know, but off to their right, there are two regiments, the 13th New Jersey and the 82nd Ohio. They will rise up from a ravine and open fire on the right flank and cause Elliott's men to panic and flee to the rear as they push through Rhett's brigade's uh, line. Rhett's men, in a far better state of discipline, maintain the advance, and they get to within 50 yards of the federal position before they're they finally halt because the artillery fire just proves too intense. They will fall back. And then they will launch a second attack. They'll be met by a second battery, Battery C, 1st Illinois of the 14th Corps. They will be uh, forced to fall back yet again, and then they will launch a third attack, and they'll be facing Battery I, 1st New York, then finally, they'll launch their first, their fourth and final attack of the day. In the words of a uh, reporter for the New York Herald, E.D. Westfall, he will recount the appearance of that attack. He said the rebels massed for final effort emerged from the woods just as the sun went down. They came into Mr. Morris's open field silently without that yell, universally accounted part of a rebel charge and marched steadily on towards the Union line. They were received with the heaviest musketry the Federals could give them, at which many of the gray mass put up their hands deprecatingly, as I have seen bummers do while fighting bees. The exertions of the rebel officers, who are really active and truly brave, brought them on in some kind of order past the point where the 13th New Jersey and the 82nd Illinois could get a flank fire on them. This added to their misery, yet they stood it bravely and came on. And Westfall wrote that the Union battery's fire was as rapid for a time as the ticks of a lever watch. One of the battery commanders, Captain Charles Winnegar, said that he had never witnessed such artillery fire before, and this man was a veteran of the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, the Confederates finally realized that they just did not have enough striking power to break through the Federal line, so they fell back to their jumping off points. The battle on March 19th ended, ended in a deadlock. So Slocum's line had held, now he would have to wait for General Sherman to come to his support. And that would be the end of day one of the Battle of Bentonville.